quick trigger warning for the first story. While it is not explicitly stated, it is heavily implied that there is some type of sexual assault towards children in this story. If it's something you're uncomfortable with, feel free to skip it. The timestamp will be on screen, in the description, and also in the pinned comment. My uncle was an eccentric man. An accomplished physicist, he was at the top of his field when he abruptly decided to end his career and retired to his villa in the French countryside. His friends and family couldn't even begin to guess what had prompted the drastic shift. He didn't have a wife or children to whom he could devote more time to. In fact, he had been content with living a bachelor's lifestyle well into his 40s, which he certainly possessed the means to do. When asked, he merely stated that he was tired of the hustle and bustle of the city and that he wanted space to clear his mind. I still remember the day he came to pick me up from the old train station. My mother, his sister, got up to hug him while I remained seated at that bench, gazing off into the waving lavender fields that flanked the railway on both sides and toying with the bracelet father had given me for my birthday. It was my first time out of the city for any considerable length of time. Under better circumstances, it would have been quite exciting. The reason why my uncle had agreed to let me stay with him was due to my parents' rather tumultuous divorce proceedings. Both conceded that I needn't get caught in the crossfire until everything was finalized. Mon Quintone, he exclaimed, causing me to perk up. Back when I was even younger, I used to throw tantrums whenever he called me his duckling, demanding that he rename me after a more majestic bird, such as a falcon or an eagle. Although it still earned him an eye roll, the familiar nickname brought with it a small degree of comfort. We finally embraced, and after a quick and tearful farewell with my mother, he led me back to his car. We agreed that since I was a big girl now, I'd sit in the front seat with him, something my father still wouldn't let me do. He was obviously trying to cheer me up as best he knew how. Although Grandma and Grandpa were never legally divorced, he knew all too well what it was like to have your parents constantly at each other's throats and you being powerless to stop them. We drove past the lavender fields and along an unpaved dirt path. I watched with somewhat unease as the closest thing to a town shrunk away in the rearview mirror, giving way to rolling hills and verdant pastures. Soon, the only man-made structures within sight were concrete utility poles dotted across the scenery, but even they were not impervious to being reclaimed by the inexorable grip of nature. They should have been flying south by now, I thought. Summer was coming to a close, and they had a long journey ahead of them. Is you a freak? How far is Africa? I asked Uncle, who was more surprised that I'd spoken to him in French than by the nature of my question. Although my mother's side of the family had its roots in Strasbourg, my father is from Berlin, which is where I was born and raised. Due to his lack of fondness for my father, uncle never bothered learning German. As a result, when nobody was around to translate, we primarily spoke in English, since it was the only other language both of us knew relatively well. I, having been exposed to it since kindergarten, and he, having honed it in throughout many years of teaching abroad. Very far, he answered, farther than you can imagine. For some reason, I interpreted this as a challenge. I trained my eyes on the horizon, conjuring mental images of giraffes, leopards, and palm trees, of sprawling savannas and impenetrable jungles, all things my young mind had been conditioned to associate with the exotic continent. For all I knew, I could have been staring in the exact opposite direction from where south was, but it wasn't like my uncle would have bothered correcting me either way. Here we are. His unexpected proclamation stirred me from my revere. Situated at the forefront of the quaint birch grove stood my dear uncle's abode. It was humbler than I expected, consisting of only two stories and a gable roof. The wraparound porch had a distinctly Romanesque architecture and was perhaps the most intricate part of the whole building, bearing the balcony which had a similarly ornate design. It was undeniably picturesque. However, it didn't quite match the grandiose mansion that my younger self had envisioned. 
there, days turned into weeks, and the novelty of being out in the countryside wore off rapidly. It wasn't that I missed the gray drabness of the city, but I did miss having friends around. I'd managed to convince my uncle to play trick track with me on occasion. He feigned enthusiasm as best he could, yet it was clear that this whole arrangement wasn't ideal for him either. Most days he remained cooped up in his study. It was one among a list of places I was absolutely prohibited from entering, and I honestly didn't care much to. I'd seen glimpses of it through the door and spotted only books and papers stacked endlessly atop a crowded desk. Hardly anything a girl my age would have been interested in anyhow. But then there were rules that made considerably less sense, such as never going up a specific flight of stairs or only being allowed on one side of the property but not the other. Entire sections of the house were closed off at random. There was even a period of time during which I wasn't allowed to use the indoor restroom, having to resort to the pit latrine outside. I, of course, adhered to my uncle's peculiar stipulations, yet I did frequently question him about them, to which he always replied that there were certain customs that everybody staying here had to obey, or else ill luck would ensue. And then... One late September afternoon, something happened that forever changed the course of my stay. The day was warm and humid. The scent of ozone permeated the air, serving as a precursor to an impending storm, a forecast further substantiated by the advancing mass of clouds in the distance. Uncle was leaning over the porch, watching me kick a ball around the sun-scorched patch of grass up front. Whenever I'd glance back up at him, He'd nod and smile, which was praise enough for me. I was just happy to have an audience for a change. A sturdy kick sent my ball ricocheting off a stump and down the witted lawn, spurring me to chase after it. Propelled by its impetus, the ball persisted along its anticipated trajectory. That is, until it came to an abrupt and unexpected halt, as if it had collided with some invisible obstacle. My run slowed to a walk. Even from my inherently naive perspective, it was clear that something wasn't quite right. The farther out I ventured, the heavier and more vicious the atmosphere around me became to the point where I could feel the weight of it inside my lungs. The ball's state of inertness proved to be short-lived. Just as I was mere steps away from reclaiming it, it suddenly launched itself back toward me with even greater force. I dove just in time as it flew past my head and I heard it shatter a window somewhere behind me. Inside! Now! My uncle yelled. He didn't need to tell me twice. Terrified and on the verge of tears, I scampered back within the boundaries of the estate. Uncle remained outside for a while longer, but eventually joined me as well. His face bore an expression I hadn't seen him wear before. I tugged on his sleeve, seeking both comfort and an explanation, yet his vacant stare remained unaltered. Only once my sniffles escalated into full-on sobbing did he finally deem it appropriate to acknowledge my presence. I could see it in his eyes, the inner discourse taking place within his mind. Even if I was woefully unprepared for the truth, what other possible explanation could he have offered me? Ghosts? That would have hardly put me at ease. If anything, the introduction of another, even less predictable concept into the equation would have made things even worse. He told me to get ready for dinner, while he goes upstairs to inspect the broken window. He promised to explain everything after we'd both had a bite to eat. Being granted access to his study for the first time since my arrival felt incredibly peculiar. A sense of uncertainty lingered within me, contemplating whether this was perhaps some form of test. Noticing my hesitance, Uncle chuckled and reassured me with a pat on the head, then told me to take a seat in the antiquated yet invitingly cozy armchair, snugly nestled between two towering bookcases. <laughs> 
He proceeded to retrieve a jar labeled Anomaly 005 from one of the shelves, unscrewed its tightly fastened lid, and flipped it toward me. I wasn't sure what he was trying to show me initially. The glass container appeared to be completely empty, or it was until my uncle slipped a piece of copper wire inside of it, then hurried to close the lid. I watched in awe as the sample rapidly began to oxidize, changing from reddish-brown to bluish-green in a matter of seconds. A complete minute thereafter, it had reached a state of near disintegration, undergoing severe corrosion to such an extent that its original form became virtually indiscernible. And then, following an additional minute or so, the scant remains of the object dissipated entirely. Not even a trace of it was left behind. Uncle explained that this was but a modest example of what else was out there, waiting to be catalogued. According to him, there was something about this particular plot of land that defied all current scientific laws. It would manifest localized spaces wherein the principles of nature and physics ceased to function as intended. Some were benign and required prerequisites in order to be observed, while others, such as the gravitational disturbance I came dangerously close to experiencing firsthand, were far less selective. He used big, complicated words like transmutational and metaphysical that flew right over my little blonde head at the time, but essentially it was the identification of those unconventional occurrences that motivated him to abandon not only his career, but also the opulence of city life, all for the opportunity of being the first to unravel their mysteries. From that point on, our relationship changed. I was no longer solely my uncle's niece. I was now his assistant as well. At least that's how he initially framed it back when things between us were still relatively innocent. He gave me a comprehensive tour of all the anomalies he'd succeeded in documenting, and in certain cases even managed to contain. For instance, there was a specific corner in the attic that maintained a constant temperature of precisely one degree Celsius, just above freezing. In stark contrast, within the woods adjacent to the villa was a location that any inorganic matter that came into contact with to spontaneously combust, irrespective of the innate flammability. Then there were the anomalies that only responded to particular metals and alloys, while being simultaneously repelled by non-conductors such as rubber or glass, thus rendering them capable of being transferred. A fully developed mind would have likely been overwhelmed after being presented with so many groundbreaking revelations all at once. However, as a child, my worldview was still rather flexible. My fantasy books were gradually supplanted by subjects such as physics and chemistry. It took mere weeks for me to acquire an understanding of concepts that students five years my senior didn't even grasp the basics of. My uncle may not have excelled as a caretaker, but he was, as much as it pains me to admit, an outstanding teacher. In between lectures, I was, on occasion, charged with the routine testing of some of the oddities that he deemed safe enough. My favorite was the one that acted as a kind of miniature air funnel, causing any water filtered through it to come out a delicate pink, which I now knew was due to the presence of potassium permanganate. I kept quiet about my various extracurricular activities whenever Mother called. She wouldn't have understood even if I had told her, either assuming we were playing pretend, or worse, that her brother had officially lost it. Things carried on more or less as described all the way up until the start of winter. And that's when it happened. The event whose aftermath elevates this narrative from a mere dubious account to my own personal horror story. It had snowed heavily. I was engrossed in the task of decorating the upstairs hallway in eager anticipation of the swiftly approaching holidays when a peculiar sight caught my attention. Gazing out the nearest window and through its crystalline layer of frost, I noticed the presence of an unfamiliar anomaly suspended amidst the open area preceding our home. Unlike most others 
This one was difficult to overlook, even from afar, presenting itself as a kaleidoscope of colors and shapes hovering just above the snow. I was about to go and retrieve Uncle, but he was already headed for the foyer. He protested as soon as he saw me reaching for my coat, instructing me to remain inside while he went to assess the situation. In an act that undoubtedly caught him off guard, I opted to stand my ground for once. I hadn't come this far to still be treated like a dumb child. My age wasn't a concern when he'd forced me to play housewife or to keep him company whenever he felt lonely at night. If I was old enough for all that, then I was old enough to make my own decisions. The moment he brought me into his room following a night of excessive drinking was the moment he forfeited his right to act like my surrogate father. The crunch of snow beneath our boots blended with the incessant buzzing of the porch light. The sky was salute of grays. Its opaqueness rendered the exact time of day largely irrelevant. The temporal aberration itself was the most luminous constituent in our vicinity, albeit not the easiest to observe directly. It wasn't that it was so bright that it hurt to look at. The nausea it elicited came from somewhere deeper, less primitive. I picked a color from the numerous that comprised the anomaly and watched as it dissolved and disseminated within an ever-swirling maelstrom of hues. I'd refer to it as psychedelic, but I'm not convinced the human mind is capable of even hallucinating something as surreal as this. It seemed as though a fragment of our illusory world had detached, permitting us to gaze upon the primordial ooze that resided beyond it. I'm not being abstract for the sake of it. There are just not enough words in the English language, and indeed any language that would allow me to simultaneously convey to you the profound, paradoxical, and existentially paralyzing essence of the spectacle we beheld that day. Imagine being told to write an essay for a book you'd only ever read a single passage from. Once again, my adolescent psyche was simply unprepared to grapple with the underlying questions posed by the anomalies, sheer existence. Instead, I merely accepted it as it presented itself, a living Rorschach of polychromatic patterns that made me queasy whenever I looked at it for too long. My uncle didn't have that luxury. The radiance emitted by the entity reflected off his stupefied countenance, Despite any discomfort he too may have been experiencing, it evidently wasn't enough to deter him from advancing further toward the blooming lights. I endeavored to follow suit, but the sensation of vertigo became too much to endure. Every heave, every wretch was like regurgitating chunks of my own soul. The ground beneath my feet felt liquid, my ears popped, and my temples began to throb as though an air raid siren had gone off near my head. About twenty or so paces ahead of me, my uncle stood in front of the shimmering mass, his form outlined by the nebulous amalgamation of hues. He reached forth. As he tried grasping at its ephemeral shapes, however, the anomaly simply vanished. It didn't disperse into stardust or collapse in on itself, rather it merely blinked back out of reality, never to reappear again. If it were only I who witnessed it, I would have thought the whole thing a dream, but Uncle never gave me that opportunity. He became obsessed, believing that the events that unfolded were, in fact, an attempt by some higher power to establish communication with us, a profound message from the cosmos affirming that he was on the right path. And that may have indeed been the case, for all I knew, yet it wasn't like him to make such unsubstantiated and fanciful deductions. I watched the gradual decline of his mental faculties unfold before my very eyes. Reason and logic gave way to zealous conviction. Most days he'd walked right past me, as if I were part of the furniture, until eventually he ceased to withdraw from his study entirely, not even for the most basic of needs. I was left to fend for myself, alone in a big, cold house on some remote tract of rural land. I tried to call my parents, but the phones weren't working. Though I blamed it on the weather at the time, considering what was about to transpire, I wouldn't be surprised if my uncle had deliberately isolated us from the outside world. 
Supplies were running dangerously low, and it wasn't like I could walk to the nearest town to get more. The door to his study looked even more imposing in the ambient glow of my candle. Pushing it open, a waft of foul odors promptly compelled me to cover my nose. The stench of ammonia was so potent that it made my eyes water. Nervous, yet with no other alternatives remaining, I crossed the threshold, stirring up a cloud of dust in the process. Darkness dominated a significant portion of the room. The sole source of light was a dim lamp which lay beside the desk, seemingly toppled over. Whether by accident or as a result of some manic fit, I couldn't say for certain. I relinquished my candle and gripped the base of it instead, then used it to illuminate my surroundings. Beyond the prevailing state of disarray, the first thing I noticed were the jars of urine stacked against the wall to my right. Nearby them was a grimy bucket whose contents I could deduce yet chose not to validate. There were pages from books and research notes scattered haphazardly about, some torn to ribbons, others crumpled and repurposed to makeshift toiletries. I ventured deeper. The rancid, stale air became near impossible to breathe without the threat of vomiting. Even more disconcerting were the subtle undulations coursing through it. A telltale sign of an anomaly, and I appeared to have walked right into its epicenter. Come to think of it, those jars had to come from somewhere. And then I saw him. Slumped at the far end of that pigsty, stewing in his own filth was the madman himself. His disheveled hair looked even grayer than I recalled, and his once meticulously trimmed mustache now extended above his lip. At his back was a weathered chalkboard that bore the marks of countless lessons and presentations, and now it bore only a single phrase. Kokuto ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I called out, but received neither a response nor a reaction. Not at first. I would have presumed him dead were it not for the rising and falling of his chest. His eyelids began to flutter, and when they finally snapped open, exposing the bloodshot eyes beneath, I couldn't help but squirm. Mon Canaton! My uncle's overly exuberant smile caused me to feel a sense of discomfort and intrusion simply from having to observe it. Having been roused from his state of semi-awareness, he sprung to his feet, clothes hanging loosely from his malnourished frame like soiled rags. He then proceeded to fish out a piece of chalk from his breast pocket. With it, he encircled and frantically underlined the solitary quotes scrawled on the blackboard behind him, as if it were the solution to some equation known only to him. Yes. It makes sense now. He vehemently slapped his hand against the surface, imparting his imprint onto it. His strained laughter reverberated throughout the confined space. It was a convincing charade you played. <laughs> but I know the truth. You aren't real. This, all of this, none of it is real. His face reminded me of an apprentice seeking to prove himself to a superior. How's was the test, was it not? He beamed, all but assured of his imminent triumph. I did it. I've passed your test. Now show it to me. Show me the truth. Those terrible eyes were owned squarely on me, expecting me to peel back some hypothetical curtain that would, in one fell swoop, validate every single one of his delusions. When confronted with nothing but my own frightened expression, a distinct shift in his demeanor occurred. His neurotic gestures gave way to a new and subdued form of madness. Why? Why do you still insist on pretending? It is over. 
The deception has been exposed. The conclusion has been reached. You are but a thought in my head, and I command you take me to the other side. He paced back and forth, avidly scratching at his perspiring neck. My heart was racing so fast that I feared it would either explode or eject itself from my ribcage. Growing up, I harbored the belief that adults possessed unparalleled wisdom, capable of effortlessly navigating any predicament. To witness the utter subversion of that notion, that lofty paradigm in such a thorough manner verged on the surreal. I know what you're plotting, he abruptly pivoted and exclaimed, startling me to the point where I let out an audible cry of fear. There was nearly a shred of sympathy left in his voice. My cowering only agitated him more, if anything. After baring his teeth at me for a while, he firmly grasped both sides of the board, then pressed his forehead to it as well. His first few murmurs were too faint for me to catch, but the subsequent ones I very much did. Not real. You are not real. Figment. Illusion. Vapor. And then came the line. The single sentence engraved so deeply within my recollection that it forever impedes me from perceiving any man as aught but a creature of instinct, concealing his predatory nature behind a facade of refinement and civility, which no matter how intricate always crumbles away under the right circumstances. Sometimes in the midst of my insomnia, I find myself contemplating whether I can still hear it emanating from some neglected corner of my bedroom. You aren't real, which means I can do whatever I want with you. I wasn't about to wait for him to charge me. I turned on my heel, intended to make a swift dash toward the exit, but an unfamiliar force seized hold of my wrist. Father's bracelet. The anomaly was reactive to the metals that composed it. I pulled and I pulled, but I found myself unable to escape the distortion's magnetic field, not with the object of its fascination still attached to me. By the time I finally succeeded in liberating my hand, my uncle was already upon me. He tore into me, his jagged nails ripping through both flesh and clothing indiscriminately. My fighting back only seemed to fuel his single-minded perversion. Despite his weakened state, he was still much stronger than I was. I'd rather not elaborate on how far he got until I mustered the courage to jab my thumb into his left eye, granting me enough of an opening to crawl out from under him. But even that achieved a little. By the time I was back on my feet, he'd already recovered. I was painfully aware that I possessed neither the strength to overpower him, nor the range to outpace him. So I did something that, to this day baffles me as to how I was able to. I once read an article that explored the phenomenon of children exhibiting remarkable cognitive awareness in response to bouts of extreme stress. Factual or not, I'm not qualified to say. Yet if I were able to be placed in that exact same situation nowadays, I don't think I'd have the wherewithal to respond as ably as I did. I raised my arms, but instead of employing them as a barrier against my uncle's advances, I slowly began to clap. He came to a standstill. His perplexity reassured me, and my applause became more fervent. I somehow found it within me to suppress all of the pain and humiliation I felt at that moment, and then twisted it into a gleeful smile. You're right. I said. None of this is real. Congratulations! You found the truth! I extended my hands in an encompassing gesture as if to emphasize the point. His frenzied eyes, one of which had become swollen and noticeably more crimson, darted about the room. You lie! Spittle flew forth from his mouth, spraying against my face. I merely shook my head in response. Despite his protest, I could tell that he desperately wanted to believe me. He had to, for the alternative would have necessitated facing the repercussions of his horrid actions. 
I never lied, I vaguely retorted, then gently offered him my palm. Come, I'll show you. Hand in hand, we stepped out into the wintry landscape. The gusting winds swept my hair aside, and its icy touch nipped at the raw patches of my skin. I paid it no heed. In the broad context of all the tribulations I'd endured, something as commonplace as the cold was an almost welcome discomfort. Do you see it? I inquired, pointing to the horizon where the rising sun met the sweeping pale dunes. He acquiesced with a series of affirmative nods, relentlessly hopping from one foot to the other. Once a professor of respectable reputation, now reduced to a bumbling half-wit, a lobotomite encapsulated within a realm of his own making. The fragility of the human psyche is a remarkable thing. That's where you need to go. Keep walking and don't look back, you understand? He cast his gaze downward and our eyes met, his vacant stare colliding with mine. There was nothing there. Nothing but an absence of self. I wanted to feel some morsel of sympathy for the bastard, but I couldn't. The wounds were much too fresh and ran far, far too deep. Quickly, go! Go or you'll miss your chance! And off he went, barreling through the snow toward the white beyond. The exact nature of his pursuit, if indeed he possessed a clear objective at this juncture, was left to interpretation. Perhaps... He genuinely believed the world around him was a simulated construct wherein he alone existed as an entity capable of thought. Regardless, he didn't get very far. It's rather poetic that the very anomaly which had instigated my descent into this rabbit hole of insanity would ultimately bring about its conclusion. As soon as he crossed that event horizon, it was already too late for him. Similar to how my ball had arrived at a sudden and complete stop, his body also experienced an immediate suscitation, only to be expelled back with such tremendous force that it literally sent him flying. He collided with the balcony, folding against its marble railing, and subsequently plummeted headfirst onto the solid deck below. Needless to say, he didn't survive. I find it difficult to mourn him. He was a brilliant intellectual, yes, regrettably, an abhorrent human being, even before the onset of whatever madness afflicted him. He took things from me that were not his to take, and growing up was never going to be the same because of it. Sometimes I like to think that there are numerous ways my story could have played out. Perhaps there's a parallel universe out there where I go on to live a healthy and self-fulfilled life of blissful mediocrity. But after all the events that I've transcribed here, how could I? How could anybody? Numb and abused, I remember stepping over my uncle's broken remains and back into that house. A profound stillness pervaded the air, akin to the tranquil moments preceding a storm, despite the storm having already passed. I entered the small, dreary library above the dining hall, set my candle on the window sill beside me, and began my search. I sifted through the dictionaries and philosophical tomes until I found the precise definition of what I was looking for. solipsism, the theory that only the self exists or can be known. This introspective standpoint asserts that one's own mind is the only true source of knowledge and affirmation, thereby emphasizing subjectively over objectively. Within this framework, solipsism challenges the commonly held belief in an external reality beyond one's own consciousness, with proponents discounting the existence of other minds or material existence as a whole. I gaze into the flickering flame, its brightness diminishing with each passing hour. It's quite the lonely thought, isn't it? The clock stood in the hall. 
One of the truly magnificent pieces of the Walter family's estate. The clock was made of heavy mahogany and showcased a large mother-of-pearl face with hands of sculpted bronze. Each hour, the clock rumbled in the hall, resolutely calling the hour the passage of time. No one knew who originally designed the clock. Some of the family claimed it was made by an Austrian watchmaker by special commission. Others said it was given to the family many generations back as payment for some debt. No one knew for sure, but it mattered little. The general consensus was the same. Although the clock was magnificent, there was something oddly sinister about it. It was a hard thing to explain, really. It wasn't that the clock was ugly. Indeed, quite the opposite was true. It was heavily decorated with carved cherubs, shined glossy. The face radiated pink, blue, and ivory in the sun, while the heavy bronze hands moved about elegantly, their pieces intricately carved. Even the deep groan of its chiming bells resonated with a kind of stately grandeur. Guests of the house often stopped to comment on its beauty, but only at a distance. Even the most ardent admirers of its artistry rarely approached it directly. Indeed, most people walked by quickly, suppressing a shudder. Even Nadia, one of the old Lady Rose's many descendants and the current owner of the estate, rushed past it when outright avoidance was impossible. In fact, the only person who seemed to be able to maintain her nerve in the face of the clock's strange atmosphere was Nadia's youngest daughter, Isabeth. At 13 years old, Isabeth was the quintessential misfit. She preferred books to play, spiders to dolls, and twilight to midday. Although she was both pale and blonde in appearance, she was a dark spirit drawn to all things macabre. However, even she was not totally immune to the influence of the clock. She'd never mentioned it to anyone, but she'd always felt oddly drawn to the elegant timepiece. Sometimes, as she made her way down the mahogany-paneled hallway, she felt as though it were actually calling to her. She found this somewhat unsettling, but also intriguing. She'd approached the wooden monolith with an odd mixture of curiosity and trepidation. Then, she'd stare it down as though she was challenging it to a duel. Sometimes Nadia would catch her daughter in the act her back rigid, her violet eyes peering into the clock's iridescent face the way one might stare down an adversary. Nadia was never quite sure of what to make of it. What on earth are you doing, my dear? Her mother would ask. The clock. It watches me, is all Isabeth would say. Nadia was always left standing awkwardly in the shadowy hall. After her daughter had gone, she would approach the clock gingerly, trying to feel what Isabeth had felt, but she could never feel anything but the vague uneasiness. Things took an odd turn when suddenly the nightmares began. Each night at 3 a.m., Isabeth would awaken screaming. It was a blood-curdling scream, the kind that caused one to freeze upright in bed, unable to move. Servants inevitably rushed in to assist her. They always found her in the same posture, in a tight ball under the covers, face on knees. When she was extricated from her sheets, she always seemed oddly surprised, as though she'd been set free from a terrible trap. Then she'd roll over and go right back to sleep as though nothing at all had happened. This went on for a fortnight. Various attempts were made to explain the sudden appearance of the nightmares, but no solution could be found. When queried, Isabeth could never really recall what had happened to cause her to scream, but she felt vaguely that it was somehow connected with the front hall and the clock. After two weeks of disturbed sleep, Nadia became desperate. The staff looked half dead, and she was at her wit's end. Determined to find a solution, Nadia decided that since Isabeth seemed bothered by the clock, perhaps she should try having it removed for a while. She called some friends at the local antiques dealership and asked them if they would be willing to keep the clock for a spell. They reluctantly agreed. After all, who would want to take on the projection of such an expensive heirloom? 
Removing Clock was a massive undertaking, but in the end, Naughty was glad she'd gone through with the operation. Almost immediately, the screaming stopped. Indeed, Isabeth slept soundly for another fortnight. After two weeks of peace, Naughty was on the verge of declaring the whole experiment a rousing success. However, she soon discovered that she need not have been so bold. On the fourteenth night, instead of screaming, Isabeth rose at precisely 3 a.m. In a dreamlike state, she walked out of her room, down the upper hallway, down two sets of stairs, past the landing, through the gallery, and all the way to the front hall where the clock once stood. There, she stood absolutely still for about ten minutes. And then, as if someone had snapped her fingers, she'd awakened, startled and confused. This was all discovered through pure chance. A servant had risen to get a glass of water because she couldn't sleep. When she entered the front hall, she saw Isabeth standing there in her nightdress. And then while she watched, Isabeth seemed to stir and look around. It was clear the girl had no idea why she was in the front hall. The same set of events transpired on the following evening. This went on for another two weeks. And that's when Isabeth began to see the girl. At first, she was a small, clear light, strangely fog-like and murky. However, as time passed, she became more and more distinct. The first time it happened, Isabeth didn't know whether she should stay and observe the strange apparition or run screaming from the hall in terror. She chose the former, much to the relief of the rest of the household. This went on for some time. The walking, the waking, and the seeing of the bizarre glowing girl in the hall. However, it was tolerated because Isabeth didn't seem to mind, and neither did anyone else. No one was being awakened at 3 a.m., no one's sleep was being disturbed, and Isabeth rarely spoke of it. Indeed, a kind of routine developed. The only thing that seemed to change was Isabeth's location. Sometimes she was directly across the clock. Other times she was kitty quarter from it. Sometimes she was down the hall farther. It became a game among the servants to bet on where she would turn up from one night to the next. Indeed, the serving staff drew lots each evening to determine whose sleep would be disturbed. In most cases, the servant who won would have to rise at 3 a.m. and take a peek over the banister to see where she was. The following morning, the staff would report Isabeth's location to the previous night, and payouts would be made. One December night, Susan, the pantry maid, drew the shortest straw. However, her room was in a different part of the house than much of the serving staff, because her room was located right next to the kitchen. This is why, when Susan came to the front hall, she was able to see not only Isabeth, but also the little ghost. Isabeth had wakened several minutes before Susan's arrival and therefore had heard her approaching. Isabeth turned to look at Susan, but the maid seemed not to see Isabeth at all. She was completely mesmerized by the shimmering light glowing softly at the base of the wall where the clock once stood. Isabeth was completely unmoved by the sight of the ghost in the hall. She'd seen it for weeks. Instead, she looked at Susan and asked, What are you doing up? Who is that? pointed Susan, ignoring the question. The girl, Isabeth answered quite naturally. She comes every night. Does she always look like that? Susan moved closer, clammed by Isabeth's seemed indifference. She studied the strange apparition, unable to take her eyes from the figure of the ghostly little girl who sat up with her face down and her knees drawn up. Yes, she's always in that position. I don't know why. Elizabeth shrugged. She seems sad. Does she move? Susan took another step forward. Does she speak? I've never tried to speak to her, Elizabeth replied. All I know is she doesn't move and she never looks at me. 
I wonder if she'd speak if you'd addressed her. She must be here for some reason, mustn't she? I mean, you don't just camp out each night in a drafty hallway for no reason, do you? Susan reasoned. I don't know. Isabeth shrugged again. It's not as though she can feel the chill. For shame, Susan said quickly, chasting her in a harsh whisper. You know not what she feels. True, but neither do you, Isabeth challenged. I suppose that's true enough, Susan admitted. A brief silence followed before she spoke again. It is odd, though, her sitting there like that. I feel like she's here for a reason, but I don't know what it is. Like she has something really important to say, but doesn't speak. Maybe you should try speaking to her, Susan suggested. I don't think she'd speak with someone else here. I'm not sure why. Well, maybe I should go back to bed then, Susan whispered before, attempting to tiptoe away. Just then, the glowing figure faded in brightness and disappeared. She's gone, Susan breathed, walking forward suddenly. She does that. She's only here a short while, Isabeth answered nonchalantly. I wonder where she goes, Susan said, not really expecting an answer. I've often wondered why she suddenly started appearing. The clock was always there before, wasn't it? It's odd. I used to walk down this hallway after dark all the time, but I never saw her until recently, Isabeth replied. Susan grew brave and moved closer to the wall. On a whim, she began running her hand through the air near the place where the spectre girl once sat. She glanced absently at Isabeth and noted the girl's confused expression. Slightly ashamed, Susan began tapping at the wainscoting instead. She wasn't even sure what she was looking for, really, except some clue as to where the ghosts might have come from or where she might have gone. At one point, as she patted an area of the wall, she was startled by the strangely hollow sound that emanated from it. I wonder what that is, Susan muttered. What do you mean? Isabeth saw the look of wonder on Susan's features. Is there something there? I'm not sure, Susan answered before kneeling down to knock more aggressively. She started near the place where the spectral girl had just been seen and then moved down the hallway, rapping on the wall as she moved along. There was no mistaking it. The area behind the clock sounded different than the rest of the wall. It is hollow here, remarked Susan, walking back toward Isabeth. I wonder what it means, Isabeth wondered aloud. There must be an empty space behind the wall, Susan suggested. Maybe the little ghost is guarding something. Maybe there's a treasure. Or maybe a grave, Isabeth countered. Why must she be so morbid? It's just as likely as treasure. Who'd bury someone in a wall, Susan challenged skeptically. Someone who didn't wish to be found, I suspect. Ugh, Susan shivered, looking up and down the long, dark hallway. Let's talk of something else. Isabeth merely sighed and began to walk back to her room. Will she come tomorrow, you think? Susan pursued. Most likely, Isabeth remarked, not turning around. If she does, I think you should try speaking to her. Try to find out what she wants. Perhaps, was all the answer she received. The following night, Isabeth awakened at 3 a.m. and walked down to the hall as usual. Again, she encountered the young girl who sat with her back to the wall and her knees drawn up. Isabeth said nothing for several minutes, gathering courage. She pretended her bravery in Susan's presence, but there, alone with the strange apparition, she was terrified. Suppose the ghost was angry. Suppose it didn't wish to be disturbed. In the end, however, Isabeth collected her wits and spoke. Why do you sit here? She began in a voice that was barely audible. The ghost child sat perfectly still, its posture unmoved for several moments, 
Then, as if roused suddenly, the little head came up and the face of a young girl was clearly visible in the evanescence. And then, a voice like wind and dry grass. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave. Isabeth didn't answer at first, taken off guard by the sound of the voice. How often had she shared silence with the little ghost? Now they spoke, two girls in the same hallway, separated by time and life. Why can't you stand? Isabeth asked finally. And why can you not leave? I stay because I cannot leave. I sit because I cannot stand, the girl repeated. Never one to be sentimental, Isabeth dove into her questioning, determined to get to the bottom of the child's sudden appearance. Well, how long have you been sitting here? I cannot tell you how long I've been here behind this clock. It counts away the hours. Day and night, night and day, I hear the hours fly away. I imagine that's quite true, Isabeth began, noting the girl's antiquated clothing. But you can't have heard the clock much lately. I know, because we've had it removed. It unsettled me so. Then what now? asked the ghost. What do you mean? Are you settled? pursued the ghost. Isabeth paused at this. No, I suppose not. Here I am, after all, mulling about in the middle of the night, but... I don't scream anymore, at least. So much the better for the rest of them, I should think, replied the ghost with a hint of sarcasm. Well, what of you? We're both here at this hour, aren't we? spat Elizabeth. I can't help it, snapped the ghost. Who can blame you for what you see? And then in a huff, she vanished. Elizabeth was equally miffed. She crossed her arms impatiently and marched up the stairs to her room. The next day, she told Susan everything that the girl had said. As she spoke, Isabeth noticed that one of the older maids in her mother's employ was watching them closely, listening to every word. How now? Isabeth said rather loudly, staring at the woman. What do you find so interesting? I'm in no harm. Bertha answered, rising from her chair and coming closer. I just couldn't help overhearing. Talking about that little girl ghost, aren't you? Yes, Susan began. Isabeth sees her. The little girl, Bertha murmured. Yes, began Isabeth. I think I made her quite cross with me last night. She speaks to you. Bertha seemed surprised at this. Yes, Elizabeth answered matter-of-factly. I've never spoken to her, but I too have seen her, Bertha began, years ago when I was a girl like you. I think she only appears to young girls, girls about her age who come in the hall when the clock's gone. When did you see her? asked Susan. Oh, Bertha chuckled. How many years ago now? My mother worked in the laundry back then. It was maybe twelve or thirteen at the time. I remember that the clock was being repaired and had to be taken out. It was a rare thing, I recall. A clock that heavy isn't easy to move, you know. Bertha paused, recalling events. I remember I woke up one night, came downstairs, and saw her sitting there. When I asked my mother about her, she hushed me to never speak of it. She was very superstitious. But I was a curious girl. When I could get no answers from her, I asked one of the other servants. It was Miss Watkins, the scullery maid, who finally told me who she was. Well, what did she say? asked Susan. She told me a dismal story, Bertha began, and not even sure I have the right of it. Miss Watkins heard it second hand. It's a very old story. She paused, gaining momentum, and then began again to tell the story. She was the daughter of a poor woman in town who came to work in the house. This was in the time of old Lady Rose's mother, Julia, mind you. She was in her prime then, not yet thirty, I believe. It was many years ago, 
Queen Victoria had not been on the throne very long, as I recall. The poor girl was ordinary in every way except that she suffered from a sleep disorder which caused her to walk about when she was sound asleep. Virtually every night she rose from her bed and walked the halls. After several years it came to seem normal and no one even remarked on it anymore. Indeed, the situation became so routine that the girl actually began sleeping in her slippers so that she wouldn't catch a chill from walking on the cold floors at nightfall. What time did she rise? Isabel asked curiously. I don't know, Bertha shrugged. Very late at night, I think. Just a few hours before dawn. Why? It's at that time that she wakes each night, Susan answered, motioning toward Isabel. Three o'clock. Isabeth remarked. Bertha looked at her for several moments, a kind of sad interest spreading across her features. Aye, so it was with her. She rose and no one paid it much mind. It became routine, the way a thing will, given enough time. The situation was never cause for alarm because everyone in the house knew about her condition. However, things turned tragic one winter's night. It was right before Christmas. At that time, Christmas trees were novelty items enjoyed by the wealthy. They were, therefore, displayed in places of great prominence. That is why the front hall was chosen. The location offered not only a wide space for lights and decorations, but was also in close proximity to the marble fireplace where stockings were hung. Well, on Christmas Eve of that year, some thieves broke in, most likely drawn by the prospect of holiday gifts waiting there. You can imagine their surprise when in the midst of their crime they noticed a young girl standing in the front hall. She couldn't see anything, of course. She was just standing there asleep. But these thieves would have had no knowledge of her strange condition. They would have assumed that she'd caught them in the act. No one's sure what happened next, but it was widely suspected the foul play occurred. One of her slippers was actually found in the snow several miles from here. Some assumed she was kidnapped, while others were sure she'd been killed and the body disposed of somehow. I'm not sure when the ghost first appeared, but it must have been several years later when the clock was removed from the front hall again. She's only visible when the clock is removed, you understand. It's said that she always appears in the place where the tragedy occurred. It's terrible, murmured Susan. Why do you suppose she's always sitting with her head down? asked Isabeth. No one knows, remarked Bertha. She said that she could neither stand nor leave, asked Isabeth. Is that what she told you? Bertha inquired. Aye, Susan interjected. She repeats it, according to Isabeth. It is odd. True. It's his strange. Susan stated. Clearly there's a mystery in all this. Well, there's nothing else for it. You'll just have to speak to her again, Isabeth, Bertha remarked. There's no other way. That night, as before, Isabeth rose at 3 a.m. and walked down to the hall. The phantom girl sat back against the wall, just as before. A soft white light emanated from her in the darkness, it was both comforting and eerie. Bravely, it's about to dress the girl again. Why do you sit here? She asked. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave, replied the ghost. Why are you not visible when the clock is in its proper place? The clock is more than just a clock. It hides the spot. It hides the spot. What spot? asked Isabeth. A stain? The clock. The clock you cannot see. It hides the place that hideth me. You make no sense at all, Isabel fumed with impatience. You speak in riddles. Speak plainly. The clock. The clock you cannot see. It hides the place that hideth me, the ghost repeated. Isabel merely shook her head, confused. She paced the floor for several moments, trying to make sense of the ghost's riddles. In time, the apparition disappeared completely, and Elizabeth found herself alone in the hall once more. 
The next morning, she told Susan all that she'd heard. Susan considered the ghost's riddles, shaking her head frequently. Suddenly, her face went white. She sat forward in her chair, her hand covering her mouth. Have mercy, it can't be, she began. What? Isabeth peered into the woman's face curiously. She said that the clock hides the place that hides her. Old Bertha said the girl's slipper was found miles from here, but that was just her slipper. The girl isn't gone. Don't you see? She's still here. You mean... Isabeth released the breath that she'd been holding. I mean, the clock. It hides where she is. Susan looked Elizabeth in the eyes meaningfully. She's still there. In the wall. Who would do such a thing? Isabeth exploded. Ah, indeed, who would hide a little girl in a wall? And how would they get away with it? Isabeth paused, realizing the rudeness of her next question. I mean, wouldn't it smell? How is it not discovered? I don't know. Susan's head moved from side to side very slowly. They sat quite still for several moments before Susan seemed to come to life. She took Isabeth's hand and took her face almost imploringly. You know what you must do, eh? Tonight you must ask her. You must confirm it. If she says it is so, what we think, then we must open the wall. Isabeth answered flatly as though there could be no argument. Aye, Susan nodded. She's been in there long enough. At 3 a.m., Isabeth opened her eyes and found herself once again in the front hall from the wall where the clock once stood. Within moments, she saw the little ghost opposite her. Isabeth began in the usual way. Why do you sit there? she asked. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave, answered the ghost. Where's your resting place? Far from here? asked Isabeth. I think you know. You do, you do. Behind the wall I am entombed, the ghost replied. Isabeth tried to keep her voice steady as she asked her next question. And who put you there, pray tell? Robbers? The workmen came to fix the clock. They came and took it all away. They saw the wealth and began to plot. They planned to rob the house some way. Isabeth almost snapped her fingers. It made perfect sense. She paced, speaking as she walked. Of course they did. They'd seen the house. They knew its layout. They planned to do it right before the clock came back. Great-grandma Julia would have insisted it be back in time for Christmas. They decided to break in on Christmas Eve. And they could reinstall the clock the morning of Christmas Day. Of course. They'd be eliminated as suspects. Who robs a house then returns to it the next day? But what about the girl? They didn't expect you, though, did they? That part wasn't planned. They didn't know about your sleepwalking. The girl's face was turned downward once more. But how did they... She paused. How did they hide you? Where? In the wall? She asked, finally, almost fearful of the answer. The ghost looked up at this. They shared a long, even look. Their faces were so similar, their ages so close. They might have been friends, cousins, sisters, even. Finally, the ghost answered her. This house is old. It's not like new. There is no wall but another room. You see me here, but not inside. Within you'll find the place I hide. A second later, she vanished. Another room, murmured Isabeth. It isn't a wall at all. It's another room, 
There was a long pause as she considered this. How would they have known there was a room behind the clock? They were workmen, not the architects of the house. From the darkness of the hall, she heard the little ghost again. I tell you true, they were not the two that came for me that evil night, but three, but three, came in to thieve and bury me without warmth or light. A third man? Isabeth stepped forward. Another workman? Another man who come to fix the clock? One who knew the wall was deep? No workman knows this house so well. Only heirs are privy thus. It was by his hand I fell. Whose hand? Isabeth demanded. If it were a relative of mine, I've right to know. The heir, the heir. Old Walter's blood, the only male, the only son. And then it was like a dam breaking inside of her. The old story. It all made sense, all of it. All of it going back to when she'd first heard about her grandmother's uncle Colin. All of it coming back to her in the oddly vivid way that children are called the stories of long-dead relatives. She remembered Grandma Rose's references to Colin's quirks, his nervous twitches, his inability to relax, the number of brandies he drank in one sitting, his obsession with the clock remaining in its rightful place in front of the hall, the way he'd become angry if anyone started snooping around the house. It all made sense now. She recalled the hushed talk about him, his gambling debts, his trouble with alcohol and women, the way he'd gone to ask for an advance on his inheritance all those years ago and his parents' refusal. She imagined him planning it all out, him deciding to call in the workmen, men he'd probably promised to cut if all went according to plan. The room behind the clock chosen to hide the loot. But one question remained. How would they retrieve the stolen items if the clock was back in its place? There's another way in, Isabeth said out loud. Of course. There'd have to be another way in so that he could go in, get what he needed, and get out again without raising suspicions. And people never look right under their noses. Never. That's why they never found the body. She'd walked some distance from the wall in her thoughts. But she stopped and turned back suddenly, walking quickly toward it. She put her hands to the wainscoting. Where are you? She asked in a shaky whisper. I can't help get you out if I don't know the way in. The way, the way is here, just here. The light appeared glowing softly on the wall just a few feet from where she stood. Just pull the latch and the way is clear. She moved toward the light, allowing her fingers to roam along the grooves in the woodwork. Suddenly, she felt it. There was a small latch, invisible to the eye. Her first instinct was to pull on it, to open the door. But being practical, she knew she must wait until sunrise. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to see anything, even with the spirit's glow. Wake me, will you? she asked the ghost. At daybreak. I can't see much now. In response, the light glowed more warmly for a moment and then went out. She noted the place on the wall. Then, moving in the front hall, she lay down on one of the several sofas. Just as the sun peeked over the horizon, she woke with a start. It was just light. No one was stirring. She rubbed her eyes, rose, and walked toward the wall. She moved her hand along the wainscoting, searching for the lever that she'd found before. She fitted her fingers into the grooves of the wood where the light had shone softly a few hours earlier. And then suddenly, her fingers caught on what felt like a bent metal nail. She wiggled this curiously, her thumb finally knocking it loose. There was a sigh of stale air and a creak of ancient hinges as the hidden door made itself known. She pulled forward the wooden door, suddenly timid. It was very dark inside. She knew she must enter to see what she must see, but she hesitated, fearfully at the edge of the dark mouth that yawned before her. Do not fear, the little ghost whispered reassuringly. I'm with you. <laughs>
A soft light radiated in the darkness, growing brighter by degrees. Slowly, Isabeth entered the room. The air was sour, dank, stale, heavy. She felt sick in her stomach, but she moved forward. She had to. She felt that. This girl, this ghost, was depending on her in some way. She moved further into the casement. This had once been a private parlor of some sort. There were no windows except in a small adjoining closet. There were plaster walls covered in fabric with wainscoting underneath. There were several small couches, a mahogany table, a trunk pressed against one wall. A trunk. Normally an item like a trunk would have gone completely unnoticed. She would have scanned the room and made no note of such a thing. But there, in the room, the trunk took on a dark, oddly sinister quality. The words of the little ghost echoed in her consciousness suddenly. I sit because I cannot stand. I stay because I cannot leave. A key lay on top of the trunk. Isabeth moved forward and took the key between her fingers. She contemplated its significance and what it could mean. A heavy, hitching emotion rose in her chest and she found that she could hardly breathe. A tear stung her eye as she leaned down to put the key into the lock. She turned it roughly, pulling the rusted arm out of the sleeve. She was torn between two impulses. Throw open the chest in one swift motion or run away. She found that she could do neither. She was afraid to flee, afraid to look inside the trunk. She sat there on her knees for nearly a quarter of an hour. Then, turning sideways, she allowed herself to fall limply against the wall. She ran her hand over the lid of the chest, trying to will herself into action. She must do this thing. The servants would be downstairs soon. What would they say to her if they saw her in there? She took a deep breath, gaining resolve. And she took hold of the corner of the chest and pulled upward. She did not turn her head. At first, she rose to her feet and took a step away from the chest before turning. Inside, the girl's head was down, her face pressed against her knees. Her hair, once brown, had gone an ashy gray. Skeletal shoulders arched downward over bony legs covered in what remained of a dress. Isabeth scanned the small body and noted that her feet were bare. Why had they removed her slippers? Isabeth looked at one of the feet, pressed flat against the wall of the chest, and then she understood. The slippers might have allowed her to make noise. She could have kicked her slippered feet against the inside of the trunk and made just enough noise to alert someone outside of her presence there. Which could only mean... She was still alive, Isabeth whispered, horror slowly spreading across her features. She looked at the horrid visage again. There were tethers inside the chest for securing items before travel. The men had used these tools to keep her largely immobile. Her mouth, all skeletal, was still gagged with the remains of a lump of cloth. She suffocated or starved. Isabeth murmured. All the while she could hear the passage of time. Seated here behind the clock that counts the hours. That's what she said. How long did she wait here for the rescue that never came? She looked around the room, seeking the little ghost absently. How long did you wait? A week? Ten days? A fortnight? Just then a click sounded behind her. An adjacent hallway revealed, illuminated by the rosy glow of dawn's first light. It was lined with several old burlap sacks. Stepping forward, Isabeth gingerly opened a sack a few inches. Inside the first bag, there were several boxes wrapped in brown paper. The Christmas gifts, she murmured. They must have hidden them in this hallway when they disposed of her. She looked over at the girl again, sadly, before speaking. Speaking. 
They must have planned to hide them in here all along, but you changed things, didn't you? She spoke to the skeletal girl. They couldn't risk coming in here to get the gifts with you tied up in here and later. Later they wouldn't come in because they were too disturbed by the thought of what they had done. But there still had to have been another doorway. If the clock was put back, they'd have no way to access what they'd taken, dead girl or not. She began moving the burlap bags. She was sure the answer lay in the short hallway. She found her answer in the far corner. There she found a small doorknob hidden by some loose wall fabric. She walked closer and turned to the handle slowly. The creaking door hinges grinded as the door opened by degrees. She couldn't believe her eyes. She recognized the table bearing her exit almost immediately. She was in the parlor adjacent to the front hall. The table's location and height masked the outer door handle. How often had she walked through that parlor, unaware that there was a doorway into another room right under her nose? She had no idea the door existed, and she doubted anyone else did either. She closed the door resolutely, putting her back against it, sealing it once more. Well, I'd say that you fouled that up, Uncle Colin. She began. You killed a child and got away with it, that's true. But you did it for nothing. You never got your hands on any of this treasure either. Poetic justice, I'd say. She would tell Susan everything when she woke. It would be soon, she was sure. Elizabeth walked through the short hallway into the main part of the hidden room again. Out of habit, she scanned it, finding a small clock lying face upon the table. She walked toward it, noting its cracked face. It must have been knocked down in a struggle, she mused. The time on the cracked face read three o'clock. A great heaving thing rose in Elizabeth's chest as she gazed at the clock's face. So many years. So many years trapped inside. You're free now, she announced through the tears. Isabeth made her way toward the door and stepped out into the front hall again. She paused briefly, turning one last time. You need not sit, for you can stand. You need not stay, for you can leave. And smiling, she turned on her heel and went to wake Susan. Isabeth couldn't be sure, but she thought she heard the jingle of laughter as she made her way up the stairs. The morning sun made its way through the curtains as winter dawn came on fully. It was time to get up.